Hello, I'm Keith Hilson with the Schmidt Music Trombone Shop, and I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about an instrument that is very, very close to my heart. Something that we don't always see all the time, but something that really has a place in the trombone and brass community, and frankly, in our history of Western common practice classical music, specifically the alto trombone. So, the alto trombone is something that a lot of trombone players may end up experiencing at some point in their career. Occasionally, you know, maybe they've done some work with it in their, you know, studies in, as an undergraduate or a graduate student. Or maybe it's something, you know, even if you have not done, you know, serious study of the trombone, it's something that has been a topic of interest for you. Boy, look at the alto. That looks like a really cool instrument. It's a cool experience. What's going on with it? So I wanted to do a few different videos to talk a little bit about my experience with the alto trombone and some approaches that worked for me, the history of the instrument a little bit, um, because it really is a unique piece of our trombone family, kind of the history of the instrument. And it's something that absolutely deserves to continue to have a place in our trombone community. So. Alto trombone. So, the alto trombone, of course, is a member of the trombone family, and this goes, the trombone family, of course, goes from, you know, piccolo trombone all the way to contrabass, and I'm sure you can get even more extreme than that if you really, really want to. Um, but while, whereas nowadays we most often see tenor and bass trombone throughout a lot of the history of the trombone, alto was a part of this uh, the, the standard grouping here. And this really goes back to the inception of the trombone in the 1500s and 1600s when we made the transition from the natural trumpet to the sack butt. Um, so by the middle, late 1500s, going into early 1600s, when we really had the development of the sack butt starting to really kind of hold true, um, there's, uh, there's evidence that of the trombone family being in existence even then. And at that time, the family was alto tenor bass. So alto trombone, of course, is in the key of E flat, so which pitched a fourth higher than the tenor trombone. Um, you can think of the same relationship between alto saxophone, tenor saxophone, or a lot of the other alto and tenor wind instruments, the same key relationship E flat to B flat. Um, in the original inception of the sack butt consort family, we had alto trombone, or alto sack butt, tenor sack butt, and bass sack butt. Now, the, the tonalities keys were a little bit different. There's some evidence of the alto being the key of D, um, the uh, tenor trombone maybe being the key of A, the bass trombone maybe being the key of E. Uh, things eventually solidified, of course, with the more common E flat for alto, B flat for tenor, and then for a very long time, of course, bass trombone was in the key of F. And this family, this consort, really held true in a lot of you know, not um, only sacred settings, but secular settings as well throughout Europe, um, really going into the 1800s. Um, when you see a lot of early music, especially, um, you know, Renaissance era, Baroque era, going into classical era, um, when you have these early music groups, especially that use sack butts, um, very often the sack butt concert will be alto tenor bass sack butts as well. And this really held true all the way, you know, from the development from the sack butt into the, you know, the, the, the development of the trombone. Um, these relationships really held true. And what we end up seeing is a lot of the commonly played um, orchestral literature from this time, if it is using the trombone, it is written with alto tenor bass in mind. So a few things that come to mind right away are going to be, you know, Beethoven and Mozart, and then going into the early romantic period here, we're going to have Berlioz and Brahms and Schumann and others. They were really writing with this family in mind. And a lot of this was because of the uniqueness in the voices between alto, tenor, and bass. The alto trombone has a unique lightness to the sound. There's a, there's a singing quality that is impossible to accomplish on tenor trombone. And it was something, for example, that matched really, really, continues to match beautifully with a vocal choir. So 
A lot of the work we saw, for example, the Mozart Requiem is very, very well known as a, a piece using alto trombone. We do a lot of doubling of the alto voices there because we have a similar timbre um, and um, we provide a little bit of diction, a little bit of support to what the vocalists are singing. So we saw this really continue through into the Romantic era. What happened, though, were a couple of different things. As we started going through the Romantic era, the orchestra started becoming larger. There were more personnel. And very often, of course, this was especially with our with our strings and with some of the other woodwinds, and as we started adding other brass as well, but we still only had three trombone players. And what happened was is that likeness of the alto trombone sound started to become buried underneath the sound. We had a more difficult time balancing with these growing orchestras. Also, we saw the development of the trombone, just physically how we were being able to build them, got better. Um, and so we began to have more access to the upper register on tenor trombone, as well as the playing, the pedagogy of the trombone was improving as well. Players had more access to the upper register on their tenor trombones. They were able to have more volume or projection on the larger instrument while still doing a lot of what the alto did. And so the alto really fell out of favor throughout that time period. And really after the 1840s going maybe into early 1850s, you just didn't see a lot of parts being written for alto trombone at all. And this really held true for a very, very long time. There is some evidence of the alto trombone continuing to be played through the 1800s and some instruments being built. There are some really interesting ads of even like alto valve trombones and other things going on. But as we got into the 1900s, it really did fall out of favor. You still saw it played occasionally, but especially in orchestral settings, it was not being used all that often. And this really held true until the 1980s. Um, there is some anecdotal evidence about when this started to come into play. And by the way, um, if you're looking for more kind of historical perspectives on the alto trombone and just trombone development in general, um, there's been a number of scholars who've done some really great work with this. Um, Ken Schifrin has done a ton of work really digging into that early history of the trombone. Uh, Will Kimball um, has done a lot of great work in kind of in doing research of his own and coalescing a lot of the research that has happened. So I certainly encourage you to check a lot of that out. But it really wasn't going until going into to the 1980s anecdotally that we started to see the alto trombone take its role again in the orchestra playing this traditional literature that was written for. Um, and so we started to become the playing and the teaching starting to come back into the fore. And nowadays, of course, it's very, very common depending on the wishes of the the musical director and the type of ensemble you're playing in to see a lot of this literature still being played on alto trombone. Um, we also see, of course, nowadays, um, a lot of uh, trombone choir literature will use alto trombone because we can get this wider spread in these vocal qualities as well, in the timbres of the ensembles. And there is a good amount of solo literature that is written for the alto trombone as well. In fact, um, and of course, you know, folks like Ken Schifrin and others have done a lot of research about this. For a long time, it was believed that there was a, a certain set of four concertos or concerto-like pieces that were written for the alto trombone in kind of the, the early part of the classical period. Now, we've gone further back and we found a lot of other works that seem to suggest that they were written for the alto trombone in mind as well. But regardless, there is a lot of evidence that the alto trombone was being utilized as a solo instrument in the 1600s, 1700s. Um, and so we have a good wealth of this literature as well as some new literature that has been written as well. Um, Eric Uwazen, for example, has written a concerto for alto trombone and there's been some other work as well. So, alto trombone, key in the, being in key of E flat, what other features differentiate this from, say, for example, a small bore tenor trombone? Well, we've actually seen some changes in alto trombone design over the years, um, just like with tenor trombone um, and bass trombone. You know, they have gotten a little bit larger over, you know, time. Um, in the 1800s, when we were talking about 
you know, tanner trombones, they had bore sizes of maybe 430 or 440 thousandths of an inch. Of course, a lot of this has gotten bigger. Um, there are still alto trombone designs out there that are, you know, maybe 450 thousandths of an inch, 460 thousandths of an inch. Those have definitely, are, are kind of on the extreme. Most alto trombone designs end up being anywhere from 480 thousandths of an inch to around 500 thousandths of an inch and going larger as well. Um, I'm aware of at least one alto trombone design on the market that's more like a like 525 thousandths of an inch. So there is a lot of disparity between those bore sizes. Um, bell sizes as well can vary. Um, you know, we see some of these smaller instruments that may have seven inch bells, uh, or not seven inch, six inch bells or even smaller. Um, you know, seven inch or a little bit larger is certainly very, very common as well. And of course we see a, most of our major manufacturers today have an alto trombone as a part of their offerings because it is an important part of the family. So it's good to know about the instrument, the history of the instrument, where it came from, maybe where it's going, why we use it, where we use it, and what it does for us. But of course, what we're really gonna be interested in is how do we play it? How do I begin learning to play alto trombone? So in our next video, I'm gonna talk about how do we get started on alto trombone? What approach should I use? How should I approach playing the instrument? So take a look for that next video and we're gonna get more into that. So thank you very much as always for watching and please keep making music.